Dirty Rhythm uh, in a Hard as a Rock was uh, is still one of our favorites to this day. I mean, that thing, that is really an album that that, that I would put that, that should be you know up there with the Motley Crues and the Skid Rows and all that stuff. Cause it, it's it's awesome, man. Absolutely. Thank you so much. How did you how did you guys uh, how did you guys get started? How did the band get started? I know it's you know I know some of the history, but uh. Well, I know it's. I was um, in a band called Roulette. I had joined because they lost a guitar player. I was recently back from Los Angeles. I went down there to go to a uh, recording engineering school. And I came back to Portland and got in this band called Roulette. And we pulled in another guitarist. So we have two guitarists. And then that band just started to crumble and um it basically kind of turned into finding a few other members and, and doing something different and uh it just kind of evolved into it so found a different singer um jeff who was in a band called grand illusion at the time and and he joined up and um our very first rendition of Dirty Rhythm was a little different than what it, what ended up on the album and, and what we toured with a little bit. But um, it started about three years before that album came out. Now, when you when you guys uh, when you guys first you know put that lineup out and the uh, and the uh, you know the album came out and everything, what was the uh, what were you guys looking for going into the project? I mean, as far as, you know, song structure and, and what kind of ideas, you know, did you have to, to put that together? Well, I don't know. I mean, obviously we had our influences of the time and the singer and I were the ones who were writing the songs. He was melody and the lyrics and I was coming up with riffs. He was also a guitar player, so he had ideas on the guitar and show me it. <clears throat> and I would just kind of take it from there. But, uh, for i don't know <laughs> i think you know, we were just just emulating kind of what was going on in the scene and what we were doing and what we liked you know and i think it's right. it's just kind of it it took a while um took about a year or two and we got noticed and and uh, things started to roll but you know honestly it was if we would have if we would have got that album out, I think a couple of years earlier, I think we would have had a little more successful run with it. But it was really on the tail end of what was going on, you know, with that scene. But uh, anyway, it took a while to get the thing released. That's, that's a big story about our label. I don't, I don't want to get go down that road too much, but mm -hmm. um, it did get shelved for a little while, which was unfortunate. I think right. we probably could have done a little bit more had it not been shelved, but. Anyway, and that's that's a shame too. When you know, with a with an album that good, and, and and a lot of the bands you know coming up at that time, you know, it it really was a shame. When you when when I look at that, you know, and, and listen to this, you know, we've been listening to it <laughs> since <laughs> it's been a while. I mean, you know, ninety ninety two, somewhere right. in there, and. Uh, right. And it was always, you know, favorite because when I I remember throwing this out to my friends and everything, you know, and I said, "Well, hey, how's that?" I said, "Don't, you know," I said, "I'm telling you guys, you know," and, uh, you know, with with some of the songs, like, um, you know, what about like, you know, some of the songs and and, uh, you know, how those were written, like, uh, you know, I remember they they actually used to play "Feel the Fire" on a Pittsburgh radio station, right. which I thought was awesome. I mean, you know, to be able to hear that, you don't hear that anymore on radio. I mean, everything now is all classic rock and, and country in the, in the States anyway. 
Like, how about, like, a song like that? I mean, how did you guys, you know, come up with that? And, and how do you feel that, you know, that it, uh, it came out as far as, uh, you know, when you released it? Yeah, that was it. <laughs> yeah, that was me to remember all this stuff. What motivated you to get, you know, feel the fire back, you know? Back right, right, back right. Then. Um, man, you know, actually, the, the released version of that, that was a remix because this guy named Phil Caffel, who did our our mix down, um, he had mixed guys like White Lion, Cheap Trick, and Cher, and all this stuff, and they had had him come up to Vancouver, BC, where we were recording, and we were pretty excited, and he, re he really mixed a great album. Well, then we got back down to Portland, and our, um, the president of our label happened to be um, a self-proclaimed musician himself, okay. a country singer, and he threw on his producer's hat, and he wanted to take some stuff back into the studio. It's not radio-friendly. It's not this. It's not that. And... Proceeded to strip down these songs, and um, you know, I had just come from recording engineering school as well, and I had pretty good ears, and and I just kind of watched some horrible things happen. <laughs> um, and I have, you know, I have the original Phil Capel mix of that song actually, which it's pretty freaking amazing, but. Oh, it's too heavy in this part. It's too this. It's not radio friendly. And they were very concerned about radio friendly right. at the time. And I said, do you realize, have you heard the new new Metallica album that just came out? It was their black album. And, like, and you think we're too heavy? Right. Crazy. So I was scratching my head a lot with that stuff. But, um, you know, Feel the Fire. And, I mean, we did, I think we all enjoyed that song a lot. I really can't honestly tell you what motivated us to do it, um, but uh, it was a fun to do the video, and, and and yeah, we did some airplay in a few other cities. We didn't get to travel too far east. We made it as far as Salt Lake City, Utah, because we were getting some good airplay there as well, and we played at the rafters there, I believe it was called. And um, anyway, sorry, I didn't really answer your question on what motivated me to <laughs> and you have to write Feel the Fire, but that's my story around it. No, that's cool. That's a, I think that's a great answer. I mean, yeah, like you yeah. said, we're looking back, you know, 20-some years. What I what I always liked about you guys, it seemed like with the best bands, um, there was a lot of guys who were like one-trick ponies. And you guys, you know, it was, a, it was always something that, you know, you guys had the heaviness, and then you can also, you know, hit with the, with the power ballads too, and when, which was huge back yeah. then. Yeah, right. You know, you couldn't avoid the power ballad. And plus, if you got a singer like, you know, like Jeff, it was it was a treat, you know. So, because, I mean, honestly, I mean, we were all, we had we had good chemistry and we did do a great album. And, but, you know, I, I got to give my hats off to Jeff as well. I mean, he just had one of the voices for the time that people would stop and listen. So it, it made it a lot easier for our ideas to come across. Just because he was such a great singer, he was. Great yeah. boy. And that makes it that makes it a lot easier. Like a, you, you know, you guys, uh, you know, gelled that way. It makes it a lot easier for the songwriting process. And uh, you know, and, and how about the rest of the band too? I mean, you guys were. You know, it was a, a really good, uh, like you said, chemistry. And the musicians yeah, we, in the band were excellent. We, um... You know, we had, well, Troy, our drummer, we had pulled him in after we recorded that album. Um, he had come up and then joined us pretty much right when we finished. He had came up to uh, Vancouver to visit and listen to what we were doing, and we pretty much already had drum parts done, but we ran into a situation where we had to just get another drummer. So, and we had a bass player issue at the time as well, and we had met Anthony while we were up there recording um and uh he was uh, a friend of a sound engineer who was pretty much um working with us while we were up there because while we were recording we were playing a lot and we had met um the sound engineer and he had a friend who actually was a stagehand and ended up being in the in the, in the band annihilator 
Oh, yeah. He was telling us, you know, the guitar player to Annihilator. I uh, kind of checked him out. They're more of a speed metal band. And right. We were looking for a bassist. He goes, well, I play bass. <laughs> <laughs> well, shit. Okay. You know, and he was just a pretty cool guy. And Anthony was probably one of my favorites in the band. And, and um, so he kind of joined us up there. So, you know, what we, what we started with when we went up to Canada was not what we ended up with when we were done. And, um, you know, there's no hard feelings now about it, but there was a couple moves we had to make that were not so fun for some people. But, right. you know, at the time we were also in our mid twenties and realizing that, Hey, you know, if we don't do certain things this, we may not have another shot. So we just kind of, we made some decisions based on we thought we were getting the actually then we were getting too old <laughs> right. to to get the more uh, the attention but um so and i think we we're also being young we were influenced by some people that you know maybe we didn't always make the right decisions but it did work out in the end you know that that group of guys troy anthony jeff and myself i mean that was a pretty good core once the album was done and and uh for a couple of years and we all got along pretty well and um there's no hard feelings with the other guys that we recorded with um i did a lot of the bass tracks myself on the album um and the keyboard stuff and i ended up kind of covering what we lost just to get the job done so you know when you got a producer Especially when we respected, you know, he was Paul Dean from, from Loverboy. And, right. And he was he was awesome. I have some funny video footage of us with him. But, um, but we respected him, and, and there were some times where he had to put his foot down and, and say, you got to understand, we're recording this album, your label's spending this money, I'm your producer, and you have to listen to me, and this is what's going to happen. And we're like, okay. Right. So some changes were made, but it had, it really ended up being better. And the uh, you know you know, like you 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 just mentioned that about you know how the producers you know handle things. I mean, back then it was it was a lot different, wasn't it? I mean, a producer was like kind of like the guy that said, "Hey, you know, like you said, the, you guys have to do this this way, and this is the way we want it." It seems like nowadays, you know, the producer is more like a a guy that just kind of guides it and. uh you know, because right. I guess that's just the way the, you know, the people are nowadays. I mean, everybody was, you know, was uh, tied in kind of like to that style. Yeah. Well, you know, Paul Dean brought in some really great backup singers. A couple guys that did did uh, all the Dr. Feelgood album. We were talking oh, yeah. about Molly Crew. Cool. You know, and it was it was really cool to see him work, and, and especially back then with the technology. Right. And what was going on. Uh, and how I and how they used it, and it was uh, it was pretty cool. I mean, I totally trusted him once. Once I, you know, kind of saw him in action and heard what he was doing with everything, and right. you know, and basically just saying, you know, he he taught me a lesson once in the studio. He was <laughs> he basically just kind of kicked me out and said, "Go back to your hotel room and figure this shit out before you come back." <laughs> Because you're not going to waste, because you're not going to waste my time while you're here. Right. <laughs> Do your homework. And I'm like, okay. And this was like a, a train ride and a bus ride. Away. This was way out. We were staying down in Vancouver, BC, on Greenville Island, and this was out in Burnaby. And it's it's literally about a 45 minute train ride out there. And so right. I was just soaking with my tail between my legs all the way back home. Right. But, you know, they got more stuff done. But, I mean, he did. He taught me a lot. You know, it was funny. It, at the same time, he encouraged me to be creative in the studio. But then when I was trying to be creative in the studio, and it wasn't quick enough for him, and he said, go home and practice. Come right. back tomorrow. Yeah. That's... <laughs> <laughs> and then as a musician, that makes you feel really good, huh? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it was great, though. It was good for me. That's what I did. I went home. I said, all right. None of you guys... Leave me alone. We're not going out tonight. I'm staying in here. I'm going to figure my shit out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now, you guys, how, 
did, did you did you get to play out? Uh, did you get the tour? You know, at all? I mean, what's some of the the things that you guys well, did as we far did as tour? Mini tour things. We never got anything major. We had a few opportunities. Uh, and like I said, I'm gonna go down another road with this label thing again. But they had some criteria that that we didn't agree with on what warranted um, them to put us out and let us take on a tour or support somebody. Right. Um, you know, they go, well, there's, you know, it doesn't make sense. There's, you're not getting airplay over there. You're not getting airplay over here. And, da, da, da. and I said, well, but don't you think maybe if we're in support of certain acts, certain acts that, and they hear about it, that we will get airplay. <laughs> right. Or maybe your promotion team can um, try to change those things, you know. Exactly. Um, so we, I'm gonna, I'm gonna blame, I would say, 80% of our failure to hit when we should have on our label because the guy who was running it was just a big piece of shit. Right. And he was clueless. And, and that's too bad. He should have, he had the money, but he didn't understand the business. He just, he came into, uh, guy made all his money in timber you know in the northwest right <laughs> he made he made lots of money and he had a friend who worked for polygram named charlie fatch who did help him with a song he happened to write it was a country song and it got a little notoriety or whatever anyway once he hit all his money and he made his he made his big pile of cash he wanted to open up a label and one of the better labels in the Northwest and he called his buddy Charlie Fatch from Polygram and who I guess signed the New York Dolls and was involved also with Early Rush and things like that and we were like oh that's really great right. but then suddenly he just he just wanted to he wanted to have all this creative input and influence and, and when it came down to it the buck stopped did what he wanted Right. And he was just not qualified to do the job he wanted to do. He was qualified to make millions by buying land and selling timber. Right. And not, not running a label and telling musicians what to do. <laughs> so um, the reason why I almost say even 80% is because during the time... Um, we were, uh, America was bombing Iraq for the first time. Right, I think. right. We were right. chasing a bunch of um, people across the desert, and he wrote a song called Pray for Peace, and he put everybody on hold that he was working with and did his song. Oh, and it man. took a while. And he wanted to release it, and, and the whole office, everybody, all the promoters, promotion people, everything changed to package his stuff, sell his stuff. Right. Push his Pray for Peace song, which was horrible. Right. And, um, anyway, <laughs> it became quite a nightmare. And he also flipped on many ideas we had for album covers and video stuff. We'd have meetings, we're all happy about the direction, and then we'd show up, and then the direction would totally change. And we're like, we're doing what? Oh, no, I had a different idea. It's like, but we just spent time all agreeing and having meetings and discussing how we're going to do this, and right. we're all happy, and then we show up, and it's scrubbed. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. anyway, it, yeah, it just got horrible, and it's really sad. It's too bad, I think, had we been in the hands of somebody a little bit, I don't know, more in tune with what was happening, I think we would have... Maybe got another album out of it with the label. We probably would have squeaked out probably some more touring. We would have had a little bit more support. I mean, we just we would hop in, we get a cargo van and a passenger van, and we'd throw our crew into the cargo van with our gear, and we'd have the passenger van, and we would just kind of traipse across. You know, I don't know. We would drive 300 miles to do a couple gigs, and then we'd come home, and we'd and another weekend we'd drive, you know, another 150 or to 300 miles for a couple gigs and come back home. Right. So we never really got established on a on a tour. We had offers, and back then, you know, like the Skid Row story, they had to kind of pay Bon Jovi, I guess, to do a, quite a few things or give up. I think they gave up a lot of uh, um, rights with their merchandise or something like that. But, right. you know, look what it did for them. 
right? And um, I don't think it was a bad idea. And we had similar offers, and the label just said, no, 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 we're not going to do it, no. So. That's a shame that they, that they did that to you guys. I mean, it's... Yeah. And it seems that probably happened a lot across the board. I mean, there, there were so many, you know, great bands that came up, like, right when you guys did, too, and, you know, that... There was. We look back at the time and think... And the bands that came up when you guys did, right at that time, were better than the ones that were that came up in the mid '80s. Yeah, it was it was an interesting time. Things were changing, and that's what. But uh, that's really what we're right. we're trying to do. I mean, you know, we we started the business, you know, uh, three years ago, and being fans, and and that's why we like you know talking to guys like you, guys that were, uh, you know, the bands that we were fans of. You know that unfortunately, you know, just never got the breaks, and and right. and we like to you know get your stories out there. I mean, because there's people that you know want to know. There's people that are that are dirty rhythm fans, and if they're not dirty rhythm fans and they haven't heard it, hey, you know, now's our chance to to, to hear it. You know what I mean? Oh, I'm always I'm always honored, and sometimes kind of there with unbelief that that it's still getting the attention it's getting. I get more people trying to contact or friending on the side and, and looking at all these views. Right. Like some of these songs are just going like, wow, God, we're more famous now than we ever were back then. Right, right. <laughs> and now we're all over 50. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's, it's, it's crazy. It really seems yeah. like it's coming around, though. I mean, everybody that we talk to, it seems like the people are, are, are sick of the, you know, the... Uh, you know, one chord and a cloud of dust and, and no talent. And people are starting to get back into, you know, the guys that that actually yeah. knew how to play the instruments, and that's what's cool. Well, it's huge. I mean, Portland definitely has a large tribute scene and nostalgic scene. It's you know, a lot of my friends. And anywhere between the age groups of, of God, 40, 40, 52, 53, I mean, that... They've created a whole new, you know, scene and a reason to go out. And it's a bunch of tribute bands. It's it's whether they're covers or full on tributes to like Journey or you know or Guns and Roses. We happen to have some really very good tribute bands in Portland. Um, you know, Hacks. They do. They, they they're they're pros. They they do their stuff really well. And, you know, our Guns and Roses tribute band here down on Access TV. Uh, Right. And, and did some stuff too. They, those guys are great. Appetite for uh, Deception. Oh yeah, I heard of them. Yeah, and uh, we had a pretty good Journey tribute band here too. It seems to be a big thing here. I'm not. I I, I play in a cult tribute band. We play free, not very frequently. I just kind of do that for fun. It's more of a niche kind of tribute. But that's cool. Um, it's yeah. It's a big scene, man. There's still fucking friends of mine that are throwing on wigs and spandex and. Going right, out right. on stage and playing poison songs. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's like, man. That is. It's, it's cool though. I mean, it, you know, it, yeah. it gets the word out. How about how about you now, Brian? Is, is there anything that you're doing right now? Bes you yeah, know, besides your cult? I, I've, I'm I'm playing. I've been doing my own music forever. So um, I have uh, my own personal band. It's Brian Harrison and the Last Draw, and I'm. It's basically, in a nutshell, I would say rock, Americana, blues, cool. bluegrass cool. influences. Um, I'm currently working on a body of work that actually tells a story. It's a, about history. I'm a history guy. I'm way into a lot of early American history and stuff and immigration to America and things like that. And So nice. I have a story I'm writing, and it's going to end up more on a theater stage it's not a club gig it's it's more of a music almost I, would, I wouldn't really want to say it's a musical because I don't have actors right. however I'm using visual and, and telling a story of a family that immigrated to the United States in the late 1800s you know and so we're cool. we're using all kinds of instrumentation as you know mandolins and violin and cello and guitars slide guitars banjos electric guitars stuff like that so I'm doing a body work right now um, which will hopefully be done in a couple more months. And I'm also playing in a cult tribute band. And I'm also 
playing with a few of the friends, just doing some original kind of straightforward rock stuff or working on some things. Um, I play with my cousin Andrew. His name is Andrew Paul Woodworth. You could Google him. He's all over the place. And he was a younger child actor and had moved down to L.A. after he graduated. And, and he was down there in a few bands. Um, he was in a band called Elephant Ride that John Paul Jones from Led Zeppelin had produced their album. Oh, that's cool. And he got to do some pretty cool things. He ended up moving back up to Portland about six, seven years ago. And he always, he's a, a fantastic vocalist. And we'd always talked about, hey, cousin, man, when you come back up here, we should play in a band together. And, you know, and then he came up here and we started playing together. So I am playing with him. Um, we play probably almost every week. Um, cool. What else am I doing? I play in a funk band sometimes called Ultra Van Chrome. That's nice. fun. <laughs> nice, that's cool. And uh, and then I just I I I'm a teacher really. Um, I teach kids. I teach piano and guitar and ukulele and you have a good time. I got personal, you know, private students. I teach out of my home, and then I also teach in a school not too far from here. And I use my studio, and I record. Uh, I've just got done recording a little kid named Nick Gimernelli. Uh He's a little rocker. He's cool. He must be seventeen, and you would think that he was probably born in nineteen oh, seventy or something. <laughs> Grew up in the eighties as a rocker. He's just this little rocker kid, and he's totally into all that stuff. It's kind of cool. So I use my studio a lot for projects for other people as well. I, I help. You know, record and produce and mix. So I'm self-employed now. I have been for the last four years. I was running guitar centers. Nice. <laughs> and um, I got tired of the corporate world. And I finally just started chasing more of what I wanted to do. And uh, so far it's been great. That's excellent to have that freedom. And that's, that's what we're shooting for now, too. I mean, I, yeah. and I, you just get, you get so burned out. With uh, with having the, like you said, corporate world and you know yes. and all that stuff. I mean, it really is. I mean, it's it, it's a it, it's really nice to be able to do what you want to do and and be happy doing it. It's scary at first, but you know I got kind of pushed into it, and and uh, it wasn't a good thing at the time, but it actually ended up being a great thing. So that's cool. It's it's great to see that you're you know still out there doing it and 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 doing all the projects and everything and and we'll get the word out for you too. I mean, anything, right anything that you guys are doing, you know, we we support a thousand percent. It's kind of like uh, you know giving back. You gave us the great yeah. music, you know, when we grew up, you know. So now now it's our turn to get the word out for what you guys are doing now and and, and making it a big thing again. Awesome. I'll keep, definitely keep you in the loop. I'll be releasing some stuff pretty soon. I've done a pretty nice album. Um, I did that a couple of years ago, and I'm still kind of going going down that path. But I have I'm, I I have a hard time keeping up with everything I want to do, so I can't stop it. I have constantly things happening, so focus. So I have to like sometimes shove a lot of things aside. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Stop. <laughs> just do this but uh, I want to do so many things it's it's tough to either, yeah to prioritize everything yeah you get one thing going and then something bigger comes up and you gotta change course and yeah well I you know I've said no to certain projects just because it's as much as fun as it would be it's like yeah but you know <laughs> maybe 30 years ago I would do that with you <laughs> right right <laughs> when we were young and and uh, didn't have responsibilities, and sure. Yeah, exactly. You can get up and do it. How about how about like? Uh, do you guys ever ever talk about doing anything together again as Dirty Rhythm? Is any you know any like a, a song? We've, or... we've tried. We've tried. It's I'm convinced it'll never happen. There's 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 only one person that's stopping it, and, and it's our singer. And I can't. I don't want to get. I don't want to get into it. Right. But it is what it is, and, and so we're all just kind of like, well, okay, 
because that's that. We'll never do anything again together. We were going to. We were talking about it, but right. so the conversation didn't go as well towards the end as we wanted it to. And the singer said, screw you guys. So yeah, that's anyway, so that's, that's what it is. And he moved. He's not even around anymore. That's tough, too. I mean, you know. Yeah, I think he... Uh, Let's just say he burned the whole book of matches before he left. <laughs> yeah, that's that's kind of like the uh, like the veto brado with White Lion too. Yeah, he just doesn't want to, just doesn't want to do it. That's a shame. No. That is a shame. Now, how about uh, like any last words that you want to get out, Bry? You know, something that we could get out for you. You know, to uh, you know, to maybe help you. I know you gave us the, you know, is there any links that anybody? You know, that people can be directed to, that we can send them to, to, you know, to check out what you're doing now? Oh, yeah, you can go to thelastdrawpdx.com. Um, you could go also to my personal site, um, brianharrisonmusic.com. Oh, cool. cool. And that's just a link of everything. Pretty much, you can catch what I'm doing there. And that's my site for my services, basically teaching and producing, and also a site where you can see my performance schedules, things like that, different projects, things like that. There's a few tabs on there. That's kind of my central hub of just what what's Brian doing. Cool. Um, you know, you can catch me there, AndrewPaulWoodworth.com. I'm, I'm the guitar player with him. You could go check out that. Nice. And um, let's see what else. What else? You know, I would say you can go ahead and check out. Uh, I think it's on Facebook. Um, Sonic Temple PDX. Oh, cool. And that's my cult tribute band. And um, I think that's about it. You know, I appreciate you guys taking the time and and. Uh, Noticing the music and appreciating it, and uh, it's kind of cool. I put that music down for quite a while, and once in a while, I'll pop it back in, and it reminds me of like, oh man, those are good times, and that was a great album. Agreed, I totally agree. There yeah. was a uh, yeah when we when we uh, when we put this together, we you know we record it and we put a nice presentation together, and uh, and then we'll send it over to you. And we'll get it out on the website, and we'll get your we'll get the word out for you, man. And, and uh, I know I in, it. in closing here, I I just say I want to say thanks, you know, for uh, you know this is from a fan too, you know, saying thanks to uh, you know to you for putting that music out. I mean, you're sharing an art with the world to appreciate, and uh, and let's just say here it's it, it it's extremely appreciated, and it's been appreciated for thirty years. So awesome, buddy. Thank you so much. No problem. No problem. All right. All right, man. Have a good day. You do the same. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for your time. Okay, you're welcome. Bye. Thanks. Bye bye.